Hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to welcome you all to today's roundtable conversation with our Sugi forest makers. Today is also a special day as the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration is officially starting. As an official partner, we're thrilled this is happening. But before we get started, a couple of quick notes. The Q&A is open, feel free to send in your questions. We also kept the chat open for anyone who wants to say hello. Without further ado, let's kick the session off with a video. Today's heroes don't conquer air, land and sea. They protect them, restore them, they celebrate them. Nature is the ultimate luxury a gift we must pass down to future generations. The Sugi Way creates lush native forests in forgotten and abandoned spaces based on a proven technique, the Miyawaki method. Indigenous species and forests are 100 times more biodiverse than conventional tree stands, which capture 16 times the carbon. These forests follow the laws of nature, and you see the difference within months. Tall trees, abundant growth, the return of pollinators and birdsong. Even the changes you can't see, healthy soil, clean air and water, are all reflected in the smiles of Sugi rewilders. Rebuilding ecosystems and communities around the world, rediscovering nature. Modern life needs more of this. We need more of this. A special warm welcome to our forest makers. Today we have Adib joining us from Beirut, Natasha from India, James from the UK and Michael direct from Kenya. Our goal of today's session is to highlight the crucial role they play in the reconnecting of communities and urban centers to wild ultra dense native forests. These forests are 100 times more biodiverse and 30 times denser and they're created according to a proven Japanese technique called the Miyawaki method. Adib, I'd like to start with asking you some questions. But before I do so, let's maybe watch your video um, about your forest. لنرجع نتصل مع الطبيعة. فينا نروح على الغابة أو فينا نجيب الغابة لعنا. استعملت غنية مياواكي تكبر غابات محلية وكثيفة بحي الله محل حتى هون ايه هيدي غابة صار عمرها سنة وبلشت تعمل تغيير عشان كل ما شفنا أرض فاضية أو بقى عنا اضطراب أو بصيص من الأرض خلينا نتذكر انه في غابة ناطرة لا تنطلق Adib, such great memories to be there two years ago with you. Um, so today your forest is two years old. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the experience of creating a wild um, biodiverse forest on a landfill? I remember we took out tons of plastic, rubble and tires and whatnot, metal. <laughs> Can't hear you. Sound. Of course. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, and uh, like in the top uh, left picture, you can see at the bottom there is uh, kind of like the concrete Beirut River. So that's why the forest is called the Beirut's Riverless Forest. And so we're really working in this kind of very tough uh, context. Uh, it's an urban landfill. It was the soil was like dust. It had absolutely no life, no microorganisms. And it's filled with those uh, highly aggressive invasive uh, trees that we had to uh, remove. Uh, the soil was filled with like trash, metal, plastics, uh, construction waste. And we even found the original uh, river stones, uh, you know, from the river there, which we eventually used up as the pathway, if you remember, Elise. So uh, yeah. we literally brought the soil back to life. And the importance of that is that the soil is the basis for the forest to be able to grow uh, and eventually become self-sufficient. Uh, it's hosting all kinds of life. And as we know, healthy soil uh, will let the forest grow, but it will also sequester more carbon. It will uh, act as a sponge. So it will deal with the urban floods that we experience in, in Beirut. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a fantastic experience. And tell me a little bit, like, 
using that Miyawaki method and planting native species, native only species, um, with the dense urbanization in Beirut and then sprawl, sprawling suburban growth, um, how difficult was it to find these native species? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, it was uh, it was challenging to find because I mean, no commercial nursery grows these native species because they're not in the band. Everyone mm -hmm. wants exotic species, so we really uh, had to find so at the bottom uh, right picture. We had to find the Khalid, mm -hmm. who's a local botanist, and he had started this uh, native nursery out of pure passion, and he eventually became this uh, our sole supplier and. He is the one who supplies uh, native species for reforestation projects all over Lebanon. So it's really about finding these key partners mm -hmm. that, you know, you build this partnership with uh, over time. Uh, and so now whatever species he doesn't have, uh, we ask him to start, uh, uh, you know, looking for the seeds and then start growing them so that in future forests we can increase the, the biodiversity as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. And your forest survived the revolution, a pandemic, a blast, an economical crash and whatnot. <laughs> we, talk, we often talk about it as a resilience forest, Adib, you know. Do you see this in the community and how do people connect around it? I mean, listen, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's a cliche, but, you know, like cliches always have this kind of like a truth at the bottom of them. Mm -hmm. So Lebanese people are very resilient. Yes. Uh, we've kind of been through a lot and so for me it's definitely like there's a very, there's a great parallel with the forest the way that if you nurture the forest well from the base from the ground mm -hmm. with all this kind of like ground up efforts uh, it makes the community more resilient so our initiative uh, you know we call it the other forest a nature-based uh, tool for ecological and social regeneration so it's it's really about regenerating these sort of like social connections as well uh, you know so I started on my own but I couldn't have continued on my own so it's all about creating the space for other people to join you for the community mm -hmm. to join you to be able to scale up uh, the efforts thank you Adib really I mean huge inspiration um, and uh, thank you for joining us today talking about communities Natasha I mean Hi. You took on a huge endeavor, right? Creating a hundred school forest in Aurangabad. We'll yes, watch a, yeah, <laughs> we'll watch a little video. Um, but then I'd love for you to tell us more about it. You know, how difficult was it to get those local authorities on board? Sure. <laughs> Yes. So thank you, Elise. Thank you for having me here and for really partnering with us to make this a reality, you know, these hundred forests in a hundred schools. So um, actually, you know, we worked with the government and this, this idea came from the ZP CEO herself. We did one project with her. We, we kind of got an award from the Maharashtra state government. Mm -hmm. And that award was, uh, you know, to get one project with the government. And so we planted a Miyawaki forest. We did an ecoscape around a PHC in Aurangabad. And the results from that were so stunning that the Zilla Parishad CEO, she's like the head of mm -hmm. all the rural area of Aurangabad district. She was most interested. And she said that we should have every child, every, you know, every school experience what it is like to plant a tree, to nurture it and to see it grow into its full form. And uh, that's how she came up with this. She said, I want a hundred forests in a hundred schools. So then it was our job to, you know, figure out how we were going to do it and how we were going to do it fast because yeah. uh, we have a short planting period uh, and, and it has to be done within that time. So doing a hundred almost simultaneously, you know, with, within a, like a three, four month period, uh, we came up with a training program where 
you know, the, the schools, the Zilla Parishad schools, they're all schools from the rural area. Uh, we had the one teacher, one headmaster, and three students who were trained in the Miyawaki method. Uh, also, what, why we're looking at native species, um, why we need to plant this way, why we need to get the students really involved. So all of that, we had a bunch of training sessions, which the Zilla Parishad really enabled. And of course, Sugi and, uh, and another funder enabled the, you know, us to be involved in this. And that's how the planting began. I mean, we would we did the training uh, assessed for the first few schools. We were really there on ground, showing them exactly how it's done. Mm -hmm. But after after like the first uh, twenty schools, the headmasters and teachers really took it on, and and students and did the planting and planning and everything themselves while we were kind of on call. So it was really making the method available. And uh, when people saw that first forest, they couldn't believe it. And they really wanted to, to try it out. And uh, it's been a year and we have exceptional results. I think that that short yeah. clip you saw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, but, you know, going back that, to that, because we've got a couple of thoughts about that one year, but why did you think, think or like choose to do the Miyawaki method, these ultra dense forests in the schools? Like, how did you, I mean, explain that to them? Because it's easier to say like, let's just put some trees in the ground rather than going through the whole motion of the Miyawaki, yeah. Yeah, so when we started, the idea was uh, in Aurangabad, we have uh, very re less rainfall and we have a very low green cover. So we were trying different methods of increasing the green cover in this region. We, we've tried a bunch of other methods and uh, we tried out the Miyawaki method, I think five years ago, we did one pilot mm. and the results were really, really good. Um, they were exceptional. And, and we also compared the cost and the... Uh, you know the the um, the sustainability, the the survival rates, and the Miyawaki method really uh, gave results that just didn't compare with any others. In the right, of course, when when we do this, we only plant where it is appropriate to plant the Miyawaki method. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, since we were kids, I'm I don't know about you, but all of us in school, we've been told to plant trees, grow trees trees are good you know and we used to go and plant trees every monsoon and then after a few months we'd find them all you know not able to survive so it was very important to find a method with which we could actually plant mm -hmm. grow and nurture trees and people saw the results and then got motivated to do more to take care of them more and that's how uh, the Miyama the Miyawaki method was zeroed in on mm -hmm. and uh, you know really uh, thanks to uh, Shubendu from A Forest mm -hmm. for sharing this method with us. And uh, what we've been able to do is get the government together. And the government, there are multiple bodies, right? There's a Zilla Parishad, there's a forest department, there, there are a bunch of other departments involved. So getting everyone to kind of come together, stick to- Not uh, easy. Yeah, yeah. The, the orchestration is, is that's why it's, it's in, in, incredible. And so, but you told me recently that some schools are already celebrating the one year forest and how, I mean, how did they take that ownership, you know, and that stewardship and did they really observe that return of biodiversity around their schools? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. They, I, I mean, the idea of celebrating the forest was entire, uh, forest's first birthday was entirely theirs, and we get photographs and videos of birds and and literally beehives and uh, uh, you know mushrooms and all kinds of stuff from uh, from the forest. Very excitedly, from uh, we we call them the Green School Task Force. They were the the headmaster, the two te one teacher and two students. So there was a task force who we are kind of constantly in touch with. Mm -hmm. um, so we keep getting updates from them, not only from them, it's from the village also, like the village head, uh, you know, the Sarpanj, everyone is uh, excited and interested. During the lockdown, we had a very strict lockdown for almost two and a half months last year. And, uh, and you know, we were wondering how the, the forest is going to survive through, through the summer, but uh, the headmasters or the, um, the Sarpanj in the village themselves went and watered uh, the forest to make sure that they survived. So the ownership was there. I think the program was designed in such a way that everyone would own it. And, uh, and, and that's how it has succeeded. Really all credit to, to all the various partners and especially those head, headmasters and teachers. And my well, I mean, that's promising because you're doing 200 schools this year. So 
Let's do this. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. <laughs> and that's also coming from the headmasters, teachers on the Zilla Parishad themselves. Yeah. You know, they'll, and, and you know, this is, this is not part of any curriculum. It's not, not a mandatory thing. This is all, uh, you know, people are choosing to do this, doing this in their extra time beyond their school teaching hours. Mm. Um, so I think the method really, uh, of course, the training that we've given, the way the program has been planned, and, and just the trees growing, that's what convinces people. And uh, and that's how now we're doing 200 more with Sugi. So we shall do you. this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Natasha. Thank you so much. You. I mean, talking about children and nature, um, James, you recently planted a bee-friendly Miyawaki forest with a school close to Bath. Um, can you tell us a little more about this? You know, how can a forest be bee-friendly? Natasha, Natasha actually touched upon it a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Thanks, Elise. Hello, everybody. Um, I think, you know, we're all aware that there's a, a massive problem in the bee and pollinator populations. And I mean, in the UK, <clears throat> their natural habitat, which is wild flower meadows, are 90, 97% gone. Um, but perhaps we don't realise how effective trees are in this respect. They provide um, food, forage, and they provide a home for bees. So, for example, the cecil oak or the lime tree can provide as much forage as an acre of of wild flower meadows so when you create these small diverse and diversity is the key these small diverse little forests um it actually can create a food source for and a haven for bees for up to seven or eight months and then with the right trees they can um hibernate there as well over the winter so it's a great way if it's done again with the miyawaki method because it's 100 mm. natural 100 percent organic of trying to give the bees something that's missing, which is a pure food source. And it's great to do with schools because they're small, so we can bring them into schools and, and kind of the kids can monitor as it goes along. That's fantastic, because one day you told me that the Miyawaki method needs a certain randomness to it. Hence, the children are perfect planters. I mean, what do you mean by that? <laughs> nature's random. Na nature's organized chaos and mess. It, it's yeah. humans who plant in, in lines and, and weed and, and try and keep everything tidy. And the Miyawaki method, because of what we're trying to do, we're trying to mirror nature as much as possible, mm -hmm. how nature would form a forest. And there is a certain amount of chaos within that. So when adults come and plant, it's great, but they kind of get into lines. <laughs> kind of like measure it out where kids come in and and again it's like organized chaos they plant wherever they want and that's what we're looking for Akira Miyawaki who invented the method he said his favorite planters were children because of that the band partly because of the joy but also because of this sort of chaos that mirrors how nature forms thank you James and then we also get often asked I mean really definitely recently um what are cities warming up I mean, because with the Miyawaki method, again, we focus so much on these native species. And people are like, but cities are warming up. Shouldn't we change and plant something that is closer to these warmer regions? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, the, the key thing is to mirror what would nature do in this instance? You know, we have the problem. Nature creates the solutions if we left her to it. Um, nature would plant natively, but she would plant very diversely. And I think this is with the Miyawaki method, what the key is to climate change is because we plant so many species. I mean, in the UK, it's about 24, which is quite low because mm -hmm. we have a low amount of indigenous species. But if, for example, we plant um, an urban forest of 24 different species, if one or two fail over the next decade through disease or climate change, you've got 20, 22 other species that can step in, fill the gaps, form a home for the insects because mm -hmm. they're and, and everything functions as normal, really. So I think we need to stick with what nature would do, which is, which is plant indigenously. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I would think so too. <laughs> James, you planted a he one hectare forest in London, um, and then you're also like onto a mission to rewild um, people's backyards and planting three square meter pocket forest. Mm. So again, you know, this method, you know, it, Size doesn't matter, I suppose. <laughs> I guess it does. Um, 
that's obviously the, the, the hectares on the left of the screen and, and um, the smaller ones. Yeah, on the, the one in Duncan. I think, again, the great thing with the Miyawaki method is, is the process is the same, whether you're planting one metre or 10,000 metres, you go through the same process of selecting the right endemic indigenous trees, preparing the soil, planting densely, stimulating the growth and kind of stepping away as quickly as possible. So from that point of view, it doesn't really change. But I think it's important to get over the, the kind of message that, that a tiny forest of three square meters in, in your garden is still gonna have an effect on your locality. It's gonna bring a home in for biodiversity. You're gonna end up with thousands and thousands of organisms. Um, you're gonna help process rainwater. You're gonna give a home to some wildlife um, and all sorts of things. So I think, you know, a small one's great. And, and it's kind of something everybody can achieve, everybody can do. You know, you can't necessarily everybody go and do a hectare, but anybody can plant a few square meters and make a difference in, in their backyard. Mm -hmm. But remind me, three square meters, how many trees is that? Uh, about 12, about 12, 12 saplings. So four per square meter, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you wouldn't plant them in all the same layers. Anyways, we have to go, that's... No, exactly. We, can't, like, we tend to use four, don't we? Like yeah. sub tree tree and canopy, just so mm. you can incredible density. And mm -hmm. Density is one of the keys really within the Milwaukee method. True, true, true. Thank you, James. Um, this brings us to Michael. <laughs> um, Michael, how are you there? I see you're on Hi. site. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, Michael, you recently, and this is also like your, or if I may say, youngest uh, Sugi forest maker, you created your first Miyawaki forest very recently. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell you, can you tell us a little bit about that experience and why you choose to do it? I think uh, number one, uh, at least, thank you so much and happy Wild Environment mm -hmm. Day to everyone. Um, I'm actually on site uh, where I came to check on the forest. The forest is doing so well, mm -hmm. and we chose okay. to do the forest because. Um, this area is a bit dry and I think the community, uh, you know, needs to understand more about restoration. And when we bumped onto the method of Miyawaki on YouTube, we followed it up and eventually, of course, we met Sugi. Mm -hmm. And it was fantastic because we learned so much from you and also everybody else who had already done something. And for us, it's not only for us to do it, but also to share with others. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm still learning. I'm still young in the team. I think I'm the youngest, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an opportunity. It's, uh, we count it as a huge opportunity where we can restore this, this place that we're in. I am you know, hopeful that in the next few years, the community, the people that are around here, because they keep passing by and they look at the forest and they are wondering, it's super dry, but we mulched, we did everything and the trees are just growing and growing and growing. And for us, it's, it's just a happy moment. Uh, right now, we have about 60 people uh, around us wow. here to mark World Environment Day. And they are seeing the Miyawaki and they have seen the indigenous species that we planted, but we want them to also do it. So that's a very important aspect for us uh, to, to impact others so that they do something in their own community yeah. so but on to that point i mean first of all thank you for saying about because you really inspired us to create the sugi 2021 fellowship uh, through that collaboration that we did um yeah. but but michael like like how important will it be for your community to understand you know the impact of that miyawaki method you know and, and i know you're trying to do the next uh, site on a school so mm -hmm. that would be also very nice to see um how the, the kids reacted to this? Well, I, I think at least I consider it very important because uh, on the day we were doing it, on this picture, you can see we had this neighboring school, like we, we neighbor one another, they showed mm -hmm. up. Um, after we finished, we had the community show up. Mm -hmm. Today we invited the, like the chief of the area mm -hmm. and to join us for the activity today. And mm -hmm. it's, the area has long been left empty. Most homes, homesteads here are bare, but it's that whole realization that you can do some restoration in your own piece of land. And this is to show them by example, because you can tell them, hey, plant a tree, 
and but they tell you okay i've planted but the technique itself and the step by step for us we see it as a way that they can come here and learn and we can help them like james said he's now setting it up in backyards possibly we may get there where everybody in our neighborhood wants us to help them with that mm -hmm. so it's that opportunity where the community is seeing that we are restoring indigenous species they are also seeing that we want to safeguard our trees and they are also seeing the importance that we're giving it so mm -hmm. it's it's a huge opportunity to to work with the community and also the school around here I think that's why we're all in this, right? It's not just about planting mm -hmm. your trees. It's really about, you know, creating mm -hmm. those healing and learning sites for the future generations. Um, yeah. Yeah. And talking about that. So, I mean, there's a really beautiful story, but, you know, before we do, so <laughs> we plant native only species, you know, with the Miyawaki method. And with Adib, we saw, you know, how, how we studied that um, mm -hmm. natural habitat and what was once there. But for in, in, in certain countries, they actually collaborate um, mm. with in, indigenous tribes. You know, we, yes. we also know that they hold the knowledge about what was once there. And in the US, for example, we planted a healing forest with the Yakama Nation. Mm. In Rio, I mean, James, you know, um, Rio, Brazil, you know, we're collaborating mm. with uh, indigenous tribes to identify what was once there. Meanwhile, mm. we figured out, um, or James did, that. Yeah. In Rio itself, where we're going to be planting, there were there are over 300 native species that we're going to wow. be planting. Yeah, imagine mm -hmm. the diversity in there. And and this is next to a museum. I mean, for people, mm -hmm. it will be like a jungle gem. Um, but you had an incredible encounter and story with a medicine man. <laughs> you know, just tell us a little bit about that forest knowledge. You know, why did he put that tree there? So we I met the medicine man on. Uh, on the day we were planting, we were actually planting and we were here. And as you can see, he was in his full regalia. And, and I'm happy you saw the news item that featured him. Yeah. So the tree that he's planting was a tree that symbolized, you know, it's, it's known by the culture and, and their customs to it. And what happens is that he was passing by to go and look um, at the tree that had fallen in the community and he found us about to plant a similar species and he what a coincidence he was just passing by like <laughs> and he asked us what are you guys doing and we told him we are planting trees do you have this certain species with you and we told him yes <laughs> you should not plant that as a young person it should be planted by an elder like me so he ended up planting it and he told us about the, the number of times that people would go and pray by that tree and offer sacrifices. And he asked us to turn and face the mountain. So the mountain is right direct from that tree. And then we prayed. And it was just an amazing, amazing moment just to be with him there. Uh, and we all lined up, as you can see, <laughs> it was quite special that we lined up and he asked us, you know, uh, and we planted four trees by the side of that tree, and those were its protectors. Uh, and it was it was just amazing and special. And then he left, and then in the evening I saw him in the news. <laughs> 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 that's amazing honestly like okay we don't know but clearly your forest was blessed and it there was, was probably no coincidence that he was passing by yeah. i mean this is too good of a story but yeah thank you all so very much for sharing your stories today um we can maybe dive into some q a i see there's quite a bit of questions that just came in um James, one for you. Where in Bath is the forest planted? Okay, found on the website, <laughs> but you can talk about it anyways quickly. Um, it's just outside Bath. Yeah. And miles outside Bath. Yeah. A little school called Lumia. Yeah, thank you. Can you share some tips and experiences on how to engage some local organizations and governments who often own a lot of land in urban areas um, so they can get on board? I mean, anyone that feels like this, this is definitely for an urban city. Maybe, you know, Adib can take this as a second. 
Sure. Uh, let me just start by saying it is very difficult. It always takes so much dedication, uh, but it helps a lot to have someone from the community who believes in your project and who can kind of like pull the strings and, you know, know the contacts. Uh, it's, it's a very kind of like personal um, approach. And, um, you know, and then the, the, I think for me, like the main uh, reason we're able to convince them is that you say to them, this uh, down the line, two years down the line, this forest is going to become completely self-sufficient. You're not going to be watering it. You're not going to be maintaining it. So it's going to be totally maintenance free. So for municipalities or landowners who, you know, like they don't want to put in landscaping because it, it costs so much to maintain they know that after two years time of initial maintenance they don't they don't spend mm -hmm. anything on it anymore so that's a very good uh, uh, kind of argument to make mm -hmm. james do you have any tips on that because i think we're all this is this is one of our biggest challenges right in the end planting we can do <laughs> yeah. but it's it's getting the, the land in those urban dense environments it is, but, but I, I think the key thing is what Adib said, is it's that lack of maintenance. Mm -hmm. Once you mention that, it's kind of like it changes people's perception of it, really. So, you know, the financial long-term setup of it is actually incredibly good because of that. Natasha, do you have? Sure, yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Um... I think showing the best way to convince is to have something to show already. And uh, of course, then, then that's the chicken and egg, right? So, but how do you get the land to, to plant the first one? And most of our plantations have been on government land. And um, one is, I think the government needs to see that, that what you're, that you really mean business that you're really going to come and actually execute something because there are lots of people who meet these officers and you know make all kinds of claims but don't actually follow through so so being professional about it going with a plan knowing what you're going to where you would prefer to plant why you've selected certain species where the funding is going to come from uh, and giving a proper detailed account of how this is going to happen we've not found much resistance in fact we found a lot of takers from different government uh, bodies and offices officials so so i think doing your homework and, and being professional about it is what matters and yes having somewhere to raise some funds from someone else who who already has a buy-in then that helps get the foot in the door thereafter the government has paid for a lot of the work that we've done as well so um so you know I, I think that's that's the method that we've used and maybe others can try it too you know we've got more questions coming in so <laughs> cost is often a limiting factor to convincing landowners to convert while they obviously vary greatly where can we get a sense of the cost in various locations and scales hmm. i mean I can, I mean, I can answer for that part because I do have the pleasure of working with you all and then, you know, our community, there are 25 of you. Um, but just to over here, um, the cost varies a lot because as you also heard, it, it depends who's involved. Sometimes the government is involved, they will support, you know, with James in London, Barking and Dagenham was, were, were involved in the council. They were fantastic to work with, right, James? They, they supported a lot with helping uh, making that happen. So it depends on, on, on what kind of um, um, project you're taking on and where. Um, so in cities, it's good to get the governments um, involved. Um, anyone has another thought on that? Um, I would also say that, you know, there's a misconception that the Miyawaki method is a very expensive way of planting, a very high cost way of planting. Um, you know, if, if we were to plant one tree, leaving those uh, three meter distance or five meter distance and actually maintain it, the cost for planting it, if we wanted to do it the right way, you know, dig that two foot by two foot, mix all that material in, etc., uh, as well as the cost for maintenance, uh, the cost for planting would be as much, if not more. The cost for maintenance is definitely a lot more. I think James touched upon that uh, earlier. So, so the cost is, it really is like what you can use, what materials you can use from your area, how you can bring the cost down. 
uh, now the cost per tree that we we have is almost half of what it was you know two years ago we've been able to bring the costs down and uh, and that's how it works and so once you once you know the method it's 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 easier to work uh, with different materials and bring costs down so mm -hmm. i think cost should not be a worry mm -hmm. yeah um the question here from Ruchi, um, the major issue observed with plantation drives is that after plantation, no one is there to follow up. How do you ensure this in urban areas? I think we touched upon on that and, and during our, all our conversations is that if we do it with schools, we have the children that become the, 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 the stewards and the guardians. Um, Adeep, maybe, I mean, I know for you, <laughs> It's, it's much more difficult. So maybe you can touch upon that. Um, yes, so basically, uh, um, I mean, ideally you'd want the community to take ownership. So really being like doing community engagement where beforehand, this is something that we are starting to work on. So before we even start planting is to actually gather the community, tell them about our project and get them excited about the project so that they can be with us from the site preparation to the planting itself. And this way they will be uh, more keen on actually maintaining and preserving the, uh, the forest. We've also enlisted the help of what we call like ambassadors. Um, and so basically asking people to, you know, come to us with land in their own municipality, in their own backyard. And so they have a vested interest uh, in that. So it's really about engaging the community uh, quite early on to ensure that they are, um, that they are very uh, invested in the maintenance and so we you know we lead maintenance sessions uh, twice a month on our different forests and they attract you know sometimes one volunteer sometimes like you know yesterday we had 15 volunteers show up so it's really uh, uh kind of varies a lot but, you know it takes mm -hmm. it takes you know nurturing that community yeah nurturing it is like the forest <laughs> very true i'm i'm trying to do <laughs> You guys are so good. There's so many questions. Okay, I'm just going to take a random one now. Um, there are so many tree planting organizations out there. What is the difference between SUGI and, or, you know, with the Miyamaki method and, and the other ones? Um, James, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you might be better to actually write SUGI, but from the Miyawaki point of view, it's... I mean, I think the key thing is, is there's so many tree planting organizations and it's great, you know, the more mm -hmm. trees are, the better, but we're actually creating forests. And I think mm -hmm. that's the key thing. Yeah, the difference between planting trees and mono plantations and planting forests is, is two, two different ends of the same spectrum. Um, and, you know, we're creating forest ecosystems. That's what mm -hmm. we're doing, bringing forest ecosystems into urban areas and semi-urban areas. Mm -hmm. um, with authenticity, I think, you know, all our sites, you can go and visit them if you want with a phone call beforehand. So they're there, you can go and inspect, you can go and hear the biodiversity, see the biodiversity and interact with it. And I think that's the key really, is, is that interaction that you get with Sugi. Thank you. That's, you know, the reason why we created it, I really wanted to do something positively impactful, but I couldn't just connect to these forests like i didn't understand millions of trees being planted but where and how and so i wanted to do to have that understanding of the ecosystem restoration and by and i thought you know with the miyawaki method that 100 times more biodiverse 30 times denser i thought that's it you know um that will give us the answer and also allow us to to stay close to the forest and tell the story of the forest like you all told today your your stories of the forest so um yeah, this is great. Thank you. So no, another question here from Sarah. Does it matter if manure, fertilizer are composted or non-composted? Nitrogen burn and so on. Anyone wants to take it on? James, go on. Um, yeah, it does hugely. Obviously. Yeah. It's kind of like the, the more com composted, the better. Um, you really don't want to add um, uncomposted. That's quite hard to say uncomposted manure um to your soil um so yes basically the more and the more diverse as well you know it, it manure is good but like different sources is great organic if possible um and kind of other aspects of the soil so that actually you don't get the leaching you don't get the runoff 
can ever do. I like bringing your carbon content up and everything. Peter here has a great idea, and it's true. <laughs> How to get the Catholic Church on board as they have so much land around the world. Anyone who knows out there who is listening in today, <laughs> we're open for that because they do have a lot of land in cities. Um, a question from Ruji, you know, can you please share a little bit more about the Miyawaki method and will it work in all areas? I think it's a good question. We talked about it, but maybe someone of you can talk about it a little bit about just briefly the steps, how you do soil, nature, you know. Adip, you, Adip or Natasha or Michael? You know? um, okay, so <laughs> try to summarize it. Just very uh, briefly. It's basically, yeah, it's uh, so even though it's a Japanese thing, because a lot of people ask, like, why are you planting Japanese stuff fruits? We're like, no, the method was developed by, you know, a Japanese botanist. But it's all about the uh, PNV, the potential for natural vegetation of the area that you're planting in. So it all relies on the native species. And at the base of it is the soil preparation. It's one of the most important steps. Studying the soil, understanding what are the deficiencies in the soil, and then adding, uh, uh, you know, organic biomass like uh, uh, manure, compost, uh, husk, straw, all these sorts of things to make the soil uh, richer, make it, uh, you know, more alive, basically. After that, it's it's a very scientific way of choosing the, the plant species, the native species. So we go with a botanist into the closest native forest that we can find. We identify the species and the, the proportions of these species, how they exist relative to each other. And we recreate that on an Excel sheet. So to recreate the proportion mimicking as closely as possible, what we have observed in the natural uh, mature forest uh, and then planting it uh, and you know adding compost tea to it and then maintaining it so to to enable all of this process to take its toll and one of the things we touched upon earlier is that it's an, it's an extremely dense forest but it's multi-layered and so this layering is important so we start with shrubs small trees trees and then canopy trees so really offering the whole variety of a forest and not just like what happens in a lot of reforestation projects you're just planting the big trees and that's it i have a, a question here and natasha you can absolutely answer that because it came up during one of her monthly um sugi uh, sessions or or monthly sessions hey what about snakes and mosquitoes will the forest attract that to the to our homes <laughs> Um, so I think if snakes and mosquitoes are around, they're around. We've, uh, we haven't seen like a larger number of snakes in the forest than we would uh, ordinarily. So, so I can't really, uh, you know, say that it's going to attract the snakes or the, if it attracts bio, it's a place for biodiversity. So, uh, you know, whatever biodiversity is around might be there and uh, we haven't seen a larger number of snakes in uh, any of our forests. So um, I can't say whether it will or it won't, whether it does or it doesn't, because we don't have any statistics to show for it. Um, but uh, I think that if there, if there is biodiversity around um, and it, finds a, it just finds a refuge maybe in the forest, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. True. What did Dr. Akira Miyawaki say? We have to let it be as it is, like very little maintenance, just letting it become wild again. Um, question from Juan. Uh, I would like to ask in a big dense city, what is the best way to choose the right place for a first Miyawaki forest? Good question. Dense, dense city. Sorry, Michael, that's not for I you. Can, <laughs> I can help with that. Yeah. I think for a first, you know, as a pilot project, uh, try to choose a location that's not necessarily very uh, easily accessible to people because it will help in kind of preserving it. So you really want to give, to put all the chances on your side. So even though it goes against, like, you know, we want to make this accessible to people, but just as a pilot project, having it protected so you can really follow up, you can really make sure like, you know, we had, we didn't fence our first 
forest and they had people coming and you know digging up the trees and taking them home to plant so in theory like that's okay that's food for the <laughs> it's messing up with the you know with the, with the ecosystem um and uh, yeah so so it's really about protection so it's either enlisting the help of residents so that they can keep an eye on it or you know like we've done with our other uh, forests they're like literally in roundabouts so it's so difficult to get there uh, like no one's going to park their car to kind of go and vandalize the forest so finding creative ways of keeping people at the beginning at least and then uh, when the forest becomes more resilient this is where you kind of open it up to uh, to the public thank you adeep um i'm looking at the time oh dear um we can keep going so many questions i'll just pick one last one um, and and I think for those who really have more questions, you can always um, email us at hello at sugiproject.com and because I just want to be mindful of your time here on Saturday. Um, final question from Maddie, you know, how can we as individuals support Sugi's mission? Very kind. Um, it's a very uh, simple one. It's two clicks away. You go to sugiproject.com and you either do a one time donation or you take a subscription. Um, so I want to just say thank you all for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you. It was really good to see you all on this Saturday. And um, yeah, let's let's be in touch. And uh, thank you again. <laughs>